Logan's Run by William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson. Read by Geekman 997. Part 2. Still in Chapter 1. Please vis visit us again, said the flax haired girl in trans pants. Logan exited, saying nothing. Time for duty, no time to sleep. Logan went home to his unit, took a detoxic, flushing his system, but this didn't seem to help. His eyes felt grainy, his muscles ached. He suited up and went down to headquarters. Francis was there when he walked in. The tall man grinned at him. You look ripped, he said. Bad night? Francis never looked ripped. No lifts or glass houses for him. Not before a job, anyway. Francis was cool and clear-headed and sure of himself. Why couldn't he be like that? Actually, there were a few DS men who possessed the skill and drive of this friendless, loveless man with the mantis-thin body and the black eyes of a hunting cat. Precise. Deadly. Ruthless. Only the thinker knew how many runners Francis had gunned. And what does he think of me? Logan asked himself. Always the casual grin, the light remark, telling you nothing, but judging every move. The hallway was wide and gray and cold, yet Logan felt the warm sweat gathering under his tunic and along his hands as he walked. He'd be all right once he had the gun. He'd be fine, he always was. Soon he'd be hunting, man-tracking a runner somewhere in the city, doing his job as he had done it for years. He'd be all right then. The hallway ended. Two men faced a smooth section of wall metal. Identities, said a metallic voice. Each man pressed the palm of his right hand against the wall. A panel slid back, revealing an alcove lined with worn black velvet. Gleaming in the velvet, long barreled and waiting were the guns. Only a DS man could carry a gun. Each weapon was coded to the operative's hand pattern, set to detonate on any other human contact. Logan reached in and closed his fingers around the big pearl-handed revolver, drawing it free of its snug velvet nest. He checked it. Full load, six charges. Tangler, Rippler, Ripper, Needler, Nitro, Vapor, and Homer. Already the sense of power was building in him as he held the gun, weighing it in his hand, letting the light slide along the chased silver barrel. Weapons shaped like these had kept the peace in towns named Abilene and Dodge and Fargo. Called six guns then, their chambers held lead bullets. Now, centuries later, their cargo is far deadlier. Identities, demanded the wall again. The two men ignored the malfunction. Identities, please. The report room hummed. The room clicked and flashed, metallically coding, decoding, indexing, weighing, processing, filing, tracking, rendering its impersonal machine data to the DS operatives who moved before its faceted wall of insect lights. A dispatcher looked up, saw them. His face was dry and chafed, his expression harried. He picked out a scan record and bustled towards them. We've been jammed here, he said irritably. Stan hopes in the field, and I can't lope wait, Webster 16. We've got a runner in pavilion, moving east. The room was a cross mixture of voices. Come in, Kelly 4, DS at Morningside 712. Come in, Stan Hope, your man is in the maze. Evans 9, confirm. Runner's destination recorded 704 as Phoenix. Maze car waiting at Palisades. Confirm. Logan swept the alert board. A light went on at the third level, east sector. Who takes him? he asked. You do, said the dispatcher. Francis is on backup. All right, said Logan. Give me a scan. Name, Doyle 10, 14302. His fat flower blacked at 539. That would be, he checked a wall, wall cron. Eighteen minutes ago. He's headed east, up through the complex. So far, he's avoided the maze. I make it he knows about the platform scanners. He's going for Arcade. KG. He must know the fire galleys interfere with a DS scope. The rest is on the board. Good hunting. Logan began to plot the alarm trail as it came in over the circuits. A light went on at fourth level east. Citizen alarm. Logan noted it. Ordinary citizens are your best runner allies when a runner is on the loose. Another light at level 5. Logan waited for the third light before he left the alert room. In central files, he punched Doyle 10, 14302. The slot instantly produced the physical file on the runner. A TD photo, vital statistics, poor patterns, name of known friends and associates. Logan checked jo Doyle's flower history. 
Yellow, childhood, birth to seven years, machine reared in a Missouri nursery. No unusual traits noted. Blue, boyhood, seven to 14, the usual pattern. Lived in a dozen states, roamed Europe, no arrests. Red, manhood, 14 to 21, rebel. Arrested at 16 for blocking a DS man on the hunt. Pair ups with three women, one of whom suspected of aiding runners. Had a twin sister, Jessica's six, whose record is clear. Logan studied Doyle's photo. The runner was a big man, his own size, dark hair, strong, memorable face with a wide jaw, straight nose, slight scar above the right eye. Logan would know Doyle when he found him. He unclipped a small black follower scope from his belt and tuned in to Doyle's flower pattern. Then he returned to the alert room. A new light on the board, the upper concourse of the complex. Francis was at Logan's elbow. This is no ordinary runner, he said. I've been tracking him on the board. He's got a destination, and he's not making any mistakes. Call me if you need me. That's what backup's for. Logan nodded tightly. He snugged his gun into its tunic holster, checked the scope on his follower, and left the room. The hunt began. Logan got off the belt at the main concourse as his quarry emerged from a public riser. Doyle saw the black tunic and dipped into a crowd. Logan stuck with him as the crowd thinned. He was still heading east, towards the arcade. He'd be hard to track in the vast pleasure center. Logan moved to head him off, but the runner reversed direction and caught a slide. Good. The man was moving downward again. Let him run. Logan watched Doyle's progress on the follower, represented by a tiny alarm trail of flashing light dots. Time to give him another nudge. At Morningside Heights and Pavilion, he picked up Doyle again. The men must know about the maze scanners, Logan thought. The dispatch was correct in this. Doyle had passed up a dozen chances to go underground. He was swinging east again, making another bid for Arcade. Logan showed himself in the crowd surge. There's nothing equal to the flash of a black tunic to instill panic in a runner, and panic would kill him. Panic and a homer. Logan moved up a level to place himself between the runner and Arcade. Doyle didn't panic. He was smart. This was no frightened psychotic who'd come unhinged at the moment his hand blacked. He dodged, he dodged and shifted like a chess player, calculating each move. He stayed in crowds, he didn't let himself get locked on in a single level, but stayed close to the main lifts which offered him mobility. Logan felt a reluctant admiration for this man. Doyle could have made a fine DS operative. He had the instincts and grace of a hunter. He seemed aware of the DS limitations and exploited the knowledge. Enough of this, Logan warned himself. Let's get on with the job. Fill up with the coldness and hate. Build the image of a jackal, a warped coward running from justice. Weak, spineless, selfish, living beyond his time. Chase, capture, and kill. Logan watched the follower. As one of the tiny light dots neared his position, Doyle should come out of the lift now. The man stepped into view. Logan brought up the gun. He caught a white, shocked face in the sights. It would be an easy shot, a clean kill. In that mo moment, Doyle saw his danger. He tried to back into the lift. Logan had him. Before Doyle could take cover, the heat-sensing element in the homer would seek him out and destroy him. Logan's finger curled on the trigger. He hesitated. That brief hesitation cost him the shot. Doyle was in the lift, headed down. Logan swore tensely. What had gone wrong? Why hadn't he gunned the man? On the scope, he watched the dot descend two levels and head south. Once again, Logan moved to cut the runner off. He dropped three levels circled to the foot of a slope ramp, waiting. This time, he would not miss. When Doyle appeared, he was holding a human shield, a girl, ten or eleven. Struggling in Doyle's arms, she reacted in terror as she saw the DS man. Logan flipped the chamber to Tangler and fired the charge. Doyle flung the girl forward into it. The blast of silver threads enveloped her, clouding over her upper body in a tight webbing. Already, Doyle was running again. A paravane was cruising the area, and Logan alerted it. The police would bring the delicate equipment needed to soften and dissolve the threads without harming the girl. Logan put her out of his mind. The dot was ahead. The main thoroughfare was thick with citizens. Among them, moving away, was Doyle. No good trying to fire a homer in this press of bodies. Too dangerous. There's always the chance that an onlooker would step in front of the charge and divert its course. To a homer, seeking a normal 98.6 in body temperature, one man was like another. Logan would have to be certain of his shot. The only sure way to take out a runner in, this, in a packed crowd was to walk up directly to him, jam the gun in his stomach, and fire. But Doyle was too fast to allow this. The hunt continued. Doyle was veering east again, making another try for Arcade. 
Logan moved quickly to intercept him, riding an express belt to the east edge of the concourse. This should do it. Doyle would rock, walk right into his gun. But he didn't. Something was wrong. It had been a feint. The dot was going down through the complex, heading west, towards Cathedral. Bad. In Cathedral, he could lose Doyle forever. And that wasn't going to happen. Logan put in a call to backup. He tricked me, and I went for it, he told Francis. It's up to you to cut him off at the stone bridge, into Cathedral. I'll meet you there. Francis didn't waste time with a reply. He clicked off. Cathedral, a festering store in the side of Greater Los Angeles, an area of rubble and dust and burned-out buildings, a place of shadow and pollution, of stealth and sudden death. Cub Scout territory. If Doyle cleared the bridge, the cubs would take him. The kill would be theirs, and that was bad for the record. Logan was well aware of Cathedral's blood in his history. Of the runners who never came out, of the muggings, of the unchecked violence, even the police avoided Cathedral, with good reason. They'd sent in a clean-up squad the previous summer to tame the Cubs. Logan had known some of the men in that squad. Sanson and Bradley and Wilson Nine, all good officers. They'd walked into the jaws of the crocodile, and the jaws had closed. None of the squad survived. You didn't take chances in Cathedral. The express belt broke down at river level, and Logan was forced to take a walkway to Sutton and use the out-ramp. These transit breaks had been occurring more and more frequently of late, and since the thinker was self-repairing, or supposed to be, there was nothing anyone could do about the situation. When Logan reached the east side of the long stone bridge, which fed into Cathedral, he found Francis slumped against the spill wall. Chopped me from behind, he said, rubbing his head. Your runner's tough. Logan scanned the area. The scope indicated that Doyle was very near, a shadow on the bridge. Logan raised his gun for a shot, but couldn't get a clear view of the man. Doyle kept under the stone parapet, scuttling crab-like across the span, keeping the thick masonry between himself and the gun. He's over, said Francis. The runner had cleared the end of the bridge and ducked behind the tumbled ruins of a warehouse, but within seconds he reappeared, retre retreating from a tide of moving colors, quick shapes. Cubs, breathed Logan. He studied the Cub Scouts. There was something odd and fragmented about their movements as they converged on Doyle. Then he realized what he was seeing. He heard Francis swear softly. They're on muscle. The small figures moved in a continual blur of motion, daring and flitting like earthbound dragonflies. Where do they get the stuff? Logan wondered. Muscle had been outlawed since the Little War. Originally developed for armed combat, the drug was designed to speed up reactions. It increased a man's strength tenfold, giving him ample time to deal with an enemy. But its action was too violent to control. It forced the heart to do a day's work in minutes. A man lived impossibly fast with muscle in his bloodstream. Only the very young could use it. Logan felt the flesh on his scalp tighten as he watched the incredibly swift boy shapes attack the runners. Under muscle, a stick in a fist becomes a steel hammer, and the swarming cubs were cutting Doyle to pieces. He was on the ground hands outstretched to ward off the cubs, but they were killing him. They were all around him in a rippling, weaving circle, and each wet, bone-shattering blow brought Doyle closer to death. Logan and Francis were crouched behind a wall of rubble facing the action in the clearing ahead of them. We'll try vapor, said Francis. Plug up. They inserted nose filters. Francis flipped the gun to V, braced the weapon against the top of the wall, fired. The gas charge took immediate effect, driving the cubs back in a broken wave. Doyle lay huddled and unmoving in the center of the clearing. Let's check him, said Logan. I can handle it. You cover me. Before Francis could reach the runner, the cubs regrouped to cut him off. They backed the DS man into a shallow pocket of stone to one side of the open ground. A second wave came for Logan. He fired a nitro into the group, and three of the cubs were torn about by the blast. This stopped them long enough for L Logan to reach Doyle. The man's face was a mosaic of blood and bone ends. His mouth moved convulsively. A word. The runner was repeating a word. Logan leaned closer to catch the broken whisper. Sanctuary. Logan tensed. The runner's head fell back loosely, his fingers uncurled. A small glittering object fell from his hand. A punch key. Logan pocketed it. The flat, dry crack of a ripper. Francis was effectively dealing with his attackers. He came into the clearing and the stepped quickly to Doyle. Alive, he asked. Dead, said Logan. Francis stared sourly down at the unbreathing man, obviously disappointed, cheated of a prize. Then slowly he raised his gun and fired a blister charge into the body. The dead runner flamed and danced into sudden ash. Let's go, said Francis. 
On the way back to headquarters, riding beside Francis in the shuttle, Logan kept his right fist closed against his side. He didn't want to see the flower in his palm. It was blinking.